Hey folks, and welcome to another Developer Essentials. So this time around, what we're going to be taking a look at is something called containers. So containers are super handy when we need to be storing multiple sets of information. Uh, so time for me to retreat down into my corner as always. Uh, and so we're going to set up our new project. And again, because we're focused on the uh, C sharp side of things, doesn't matter whether we're working with a 2D or a 3D project. I'm just gonna stick with 3D for this. Uh, so that's going to be creating. So while that's creating, so the a bit of background on containers. So where we use containers is any time where if we're needing to store multiple of the same type. So this is an important thing that containers typically can only store one type of information. So you might have a container that can store floats or a container that can store integers but we wouldn't then be able to, in that same container, put in something like an inventory item. So they're linked to a particular type of thing that they actually store. So where might we use things like of this? So a good example is stuff where if we've got like an inventory system, we have multiple items that we're storing, and it's really helpful if we can store that group together because that means then we could take that inventory and then we can be passing that to things like a user interface for drawing it. We could be passing it to stuff for having particular you know, status effects potentially applied. Uh, to inventories, things like that, it's really helpful for. You know, we could be using it for keeping track of things like upgrades that characters might have. We could also be using our, our containers for storing things like settings. So a really easy way of being able to look up and go, okay, what is the player's, you know, uh, setting for inverting the Y axis? What is the player's mouse sensitivity or controller sensitivity? We could be storing those, again, all neatly packaged together. And that's the thing we get from containers. They're a way of grouping related information and packaging it together so that we can just then pass around that package of information and then to do you know, with 50 more different variables. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at today with this. Now there's a related area to containers that we will look at in another video, something called loops or iteration. So when we look at the loops or iteration one, that's one that we'll be you know, throwing back a little bit to uh, containers there. And that's something where if you're wanting a really good video to watch immediately after this one, the loops one, the iteration one there would be the one that I would be recommending. Cool, so we've got our project up. So as always, uh, I am going to be adding in ye olde cube. Uh, and again, keeping, keeping sort of good habits, uh, trying to keep these from the start of, we set up a separate folder for our scripts and then we create a particular script within that, remembering our naming requirements there where no spaces. And if we have numbers, those numbers go with the, they, they can't be the first character there. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to call this container demo one. So I feel like we're going to end up with more than one container demo script uh, is, is likely what's going to happen here. Cool. So I've got that. I can attach that onto my cube. And you might notice that I wait a little bit before attaching it. That's because as soon as you create that file, Unity then needs to compile it. And, and, run, and run those sort of initial little bits on it before I can actually attach it. That's why I always wait a little bit after creating the script because if I create it and then try and add it straight away, it usually won't be able to. It'll usually put up an error saying that it's still compiling. So let's load that up and we'll be able to go from there. So this is what we normally see when we, we start up. We've got our start and update functions. We've got the things that we're uh, bringing in those extra tools. Now, 
we're actually going to be using some things that are in these. So collections is what C Sharp uses to describe containers typically. So whereas you know, we, we might be referring to it as containers in C Sharp, that means collections. So this is telling us to bring in a couple of things related to those collections, those containers, so that we've got access to them. So let's start looking at a couple of these. So if we wanted to store, say, a whole bunch of different names, for example, up until now, and if we weren't using containers, the way that we would have to approach doing this is we would be setting up something like of this. So name, uh, so names are typically, that's going to be there as a string. So we might have name one equals A. And then name two. That's kind of cool. But if we wanted to randomly pick from one of those, so, you know, if we've just got two, we could write the code to randomly pick fairly easily. Uh, so if we want to randomly pick from stuff, we can do that using something called random range. So what I would be able to do there is I could do something like, okay, random dot range. Now we've got two versions of this and we can see that because it's saying one of two. So let's look at the differences here. We have a version that includes floats and it's specifically saying inclusive and we'll get to what that means in a moment. We also have an integer version where it's inclusive of the min, but exclusive of the max. So what it, what it means by when it's saying inclusive or exclusive there is the min being inclusive means whatever we use, give us our minimum value, it can give us that back. The max though is exclusive, which means it will never be able to give us back that value. It can only give us back up to one less than that in the case of the integer one. The floating point one though is inclusive of both. So our min and max, it actually can give those values back. So I could do something here where, okay, I want to roll, do a, essentially a dice roll. Now this is where for doing a dice roll, so let's say I'm using a six sided dice. I, if I did one to six, because it's exclusive of the maximum value there, I would only be able to get a range of one to five. So I would need to actually put either seven or things like of this, I often will actually write it as six plus one, just so I know that it's explicitly getting there and, and adding that one extra because of the, the max being exclusive. So I could do that dice roll, and if it's less than or equal to three, not 23, uh, then I debug log out chosen name is name one. So I could do that. Otherwise, we display name two. There's a name is... So this is okay for, you know, if we've got a couple of ones. If we had five to ten, it's still doable. Code's going to get really messy though. It's you know, we're duplicating the code a lot. We can see there'll be a lot of redundancy there in the code. So as soon as we start getting more and more ones, it really gets problematic. And you know, if we got to 50 or 100 of those, none of us wants to be the person duplicating the code 50 to 100 times. And worse, say we then go from 50 to 100, there's a lot of work we need to do to maintain and update that code. And so using things like containers allows us to make it easier to maintain the code because it allows us to make the code simpler. And that's a big part of what it's about. So this would be the, the non-container version. Let's take a look at a couple of containers though. So what I am going to do is the first container that I am going to use is something called a list. 
So the way we write this, because I said containers have a type that they can store, and they can only store that one type. So we never just create a list, we create a list of a particular type. So I'm creating a list, and the way that I say what type it holds is I use these angled brackets. So typically in C-sharp, uh, where you're seeing angled brackets, it's always going to be a type that goes between those. So angled brackets, we put a type in there. So just like uh, braces are used for containing code, parentheses are used for containing data, angled brackets are used for containing a type. So we'd say a list of string, and this might be the first names. So that's cool, and I would find with this, because it's a public variable, if I go back to Unity and then select the cube, we'll notice a really cool thing here. So first names is there, and I can just add my names in here. And if you're using one of the newer versions of Unity, so uh, pretty much the 2021 series or later, you can reorder these. So if we had A and B and C, then I can actually change the order of these just by dragging around. Uh, that's not something if you're using an older version of Unity that will be there by default, uh, but it's something that's built in from def uh, the get-go with the newer versions of Unity. So that makes it easy for me uh, customizing that. I can add things into it, but what does my code now look like? So I'm going to use a temporary variable for this of selected first name. So I need to be able to access the stuff within here. So the way we access stuff in a list is we use square brackets. And let's just start with, I pick the first one. So lists, the way we access particular elements in that is using something called the index. So braces contain code, parentheses contain data, angled brackets contain types. Square brackets are used for containing a index or a position or a key, something that you're using to look up another value. And for something like a list, the very first index is always zero. So in C sharp, lists, arrays, similar things like of that, they are zero based indices. That's not necessarily the same in other languages. Some languages it will start at one, some languages will allow you to customize where it starts at, but in C sharp, zero is the first element. So if I save that, and we're going to put out our log. So name is selected first name, and then let's run that. So we can hit play and what we should see if we go to the console, so selected name is A. Now let's reorder this and test it again. And so now we're getting C back and if we relocate again and run it again, we should see A. So that's cool. So we know that zero works. Well, if zero is the first element, then one's going to be the second, two's going to be the third. What if we wanted to grab the last element? So we can actually ask our list how many elements are in it. So that's the count. Now, this is actually going to break. And if you want to pause at this point, have a bit of a think about why it's potentially going to break. And it's to do with, you know, we know the index starts at zero. So it is going to cause an issue. But this is an issue that we're going to run into a lot of times. It's really easy to run into. So it's good to see this issue early. So let's see what happens. 
So we come and we'll be able to play it. And then we get an error that we, you know, it's good to get used to seeing this error because you will see it a lot of times. It does happen so often. I run, I've been coding for so long and I still see this uh, error plenty of times because it's so easy to have happen. Uh, so it's saying an argument out of range exception. Index was out of range. It must be non-negative, so it has to be zero or above, and it must be less than the size of the collection. So that's the key thing there, that it must be less than the size of the collection. I gave it a value that is the size of the collection. So if I wanted to access the last element, I would need to do that, minus one. Now if I run that, that will be fine. And this has a really handy side effect, which we'll see in a moment. So that works well, it's giving us the last value, but again, let's just check that I'm not making stuff up. And we should see it output B, which it does, which is good. So let's come and see the handy side effect here, because this, because it always has to be one less than count, which count is an integer, I can do random dot range from zero, because that's a valid one, to first names dot count, because I know that random range can't give me back count. It will only ever give me back one less than that. So this will pick a random first name. So that. Let's take a look at what that does. That should mean that we, it'll pick a random one from our list. So that's cool, we got B. And what we will find, so A that time is now, because we're saying, okay, well, you know, the maintenance overhead of if we add in extra things now, well, I'm gonna add in several different extra names and I don't need to change the code. It's the advantage of using this kind of setup where I haven't hard coded in any particular values. The zero is a safe one to hard code in. It's like a universal constant effectively, uh, but I'm just using the, the amount of names that are there. So it means that changing the number of names isn't gonna cause any issues. Uh, I can, add in as many names as I want and I never need to touch the code. And that's a good thing. When you can have systems like that, that are data driven is what we'd refer to them as. Those are really handy because say you're working on a, a project where you've got a small team of people. This is something where you could have someone just focusing on, you know, setting up data like of this and they don't need to go and change code or get a programmer to go and update code there for them uh, to make the stuff work. And that's good because it allows people to work in parallel, allows people to work independently. It allows people to just really make you know, changes without having to do a whole lot of extra overhead. And it lowers the risk of stuff because once we've validated and we're confident that this is working, then you know, we, we don't need to worry typically about that then breaking. There is a way that this can break. I'm going to intentionally show you how to break this. So the way to do this is if I chuck the select first names uh, down to zero, so I've got none, let's see what happens. Because this is again, a really easy error to run into. I still run into this one. Um, so we're getting that out of range thing. Because if we look at this, so it's going to pick a random number between zero and zero. So the only value this can give us back is going to be zero. So it's trying to access the first name stored at position zero, but we don't, that would require us to have at least one entry in there and we don't. So we might need to have a setup here where what we do is, okay, if first names dot count, is equal to zero, then there's a couple of things that we could do. So in this case, I'm gonna say, and actually this is a case where rather than using a debug log, we can use a debug log error. 
no first names have been set up. So there's a couple of different philosophies that we can follow with uh, scenarios like this where we have bad data. So the two main sort of schools of thought on this, one is that you try and keep the project up and running. Uh, regardless of if there's bad data, that you safely handle it, you put in safe defaults, things like of that. The other school of thought, uh, which is more my approach, is if there is bad data, you don't try and safely manage and keep the program running. If there is bad data, then you hard fail uh, and you actually you know, stop the application. The reason I prefer that approach, um, and that's the that's approach I got from uh, some of the places worked in industry, is it avoids problems being hidden for a long time period. Because the longer a bug and error is hidden, the and the less critical it seems, which if, it's, if everything keeps appears to be running, it'll seem less critical. So the longer that lasts, the harder it can be to fix it because what can end up happening is you can build assumptions on top of that bug uh, and that can be really bad. So you can end up with lots and lots of layers of code that are predicated on the buggy behavior, which is not, not ideal. So having things fail noisily is a great way of actually sort of just making sure problems get addressed. Uh, so I think putting out a log error, my general approach is if there is an error, you stop, you fix it. So in a case like of this, I'm not going to stop it from triggering an exception, but I'm going to make sure there's a bit more context beforehand. Uh, so in this case, uh, run validity safety check on the first names. So now it'll still trigger the exception and that's okay. I want it to, because again, problems, you want them to be visible so that they get fixed. But now I know because we, we go for the approach of when we're sorting out errors, we start at the first one and we work our way down. This, I can immediately see what the particular problem is and that's a good thing. Uh, so I'm gonna restore uh, the names. So you can undo a lot of changes like that, which is good. So that's good. We've got the random first names we've seen using a list. We can access stuff, different elements. One of the really cool things with lists is lists can change their size while we're running. So if you need a container that needs to be able to shrink or grow over time, a list is going to allow you to do that. Because maybe I've picked this name and then I could remove that name from the list if I wanted, or I could add in an extra one. So I'm actually going to set up a list of strings, and this is gonna be the chosen names. Now this one, I'm actually going to not make it public. So it's going to be up here in the top, uh, so outside of a function, which means anything inside this file can access it, but I'm not making it public, so it won't appear in the inspector. Won't, it'll also mean that any entries I add to that while it's running don't get stored, doesn't get remembered. But what I'm going to do is, after I've picked that first name, I'm gonna say chosen names, I want you to add so for a list, we can add things uh, by using this function. And I want to say add that selected first name. So we are storing the selected name. And this is going to actually probably break. And again, I'm intentionally going to be running into errors in this uh, because as, as I said in the early videos, you want to run into errors, especially at these early stages. Errors are not a bad thing. Errors are something that you want to see as many of them as rapidly as possible, because 
you need to learn how to actually fix those errors. So we're not going to learn unless we run into them, so we have to. So we play it, and now this is a type of exception I can guarantee you are going to see a lot of times. Uh, if, I, if I had a dollar for every time I have managed to cause a null reference exception, uh, I would probably be able to buy my own planet. Um, not that I'm sure any are for sale, but I'd probably be able to. Uh, so a null reference exception. This is a thing we're going to see a lot of. Uh, so it essentially is meaning that something doesn't exist. So when we see a null reference exception, it's telling us it's on line 24. So we know it's this line. With a null reference exception, you want to look to the left of a dot. With a null reference exception, almost always the error is going to be on whatever thing is on the left hand side of the dot. So there is a problem with chosen names. Now we can see there is a difference in how these two are set up, but that's not the fix. So the fix isn't to go and make this public. The fix is we typically need to get here and say this. So the difference between in what's happening here. So the difference between this versus having the new in there is this. So when I've got this, what I have done is I have marked out a space on the floor where I have said, here is where my chair is going to be. The chair isn't there. The space is marked out on the floor. I've got the pieces for it sitting next to that space. I've got the plans so I know how to put it together, hopefully without having any bits left over. Uh, so I know, I know where it is going to be, but it isn't there yet. When I try and do add, while it is in that state, it is like you are trying to go and sit on a chair when you've just actually marked out on the floor, chair goes here. What happens, and I won't demonstrate this, uh, is you, you, you fall on your ass. Uh, that's what happens. And that's what that no reference exception is. It's the computer falling on its ass. That's the experience of a null reference exception for it, in case anyone was wondering. It's that, uh, that painful falling down and that also, also embarrassment of, okay, how did I manage to have that happen again? So when we have this equals new list string, and it's not a coincidence that it matches exactly what's there before the variable name, when I'm doing this, I'm actually going and building the chair and placing it in that spot. So that now, when I go and sit down on it, I'm fine. I get to sit there and it's like, hey, cool. There was no bits left over. This chair has actually got some good structural integrity. Uh, and I don't end up falling onto the floor, uh, which is ideal. So if I run this now, then we'll be able to see what happens. And it's fine. We don't get any errors, the code has run, which is good. So we could also be doing this for the public one as well. You don't have to, but if it makes it easier to remember early on, then by all means, uh, make sure that you're including that. Um, so we can be adding stuff to it, which is cool. And you know, I am going to move this around. So I'm going to move this up here. And what I'm going to do is say here, we have selected chosen names dot count names, just so we can see that yes, data has actually really gone into that. And so we'll be able to run that and we should see that there is one name. So cool, we've done that. So that's good. What if we wanted to remove something from it? So I was mentioning before that we might want to, you know, pick this name and then remove it from that list. 
which we can do that. So to do that, there's a couple of different ways we can approach removing something. So what we can do is first names dot remove, and then we give it the value that we already picked out. So we can either remove things based upon their position, or we can remove things based upon their value. Uh, so the reason why we might want to do this after we've randomly picked one is so we can randomly pick again and we won't repeat that same name. So it's a really handy way of being able to pick something, pick multiple random things, but know that you are not picking the same thing again. Uh, and remove from list. So that works. Now with that, we're, we're removing something that's there in the inspector. So let's see how that behaves. We wanna make sure we take a close look at the cube um, so we can see our list of names. So we run it. So name is uh, D and we can see it's removed that from the list, but as soon as we stop it, it comes back. So we can make modifications like that and it will just get reset because they're only changing the uh, version of that information that we've got there uh, while we're running. So we can easily make those kinds of changes, which is cool. So, okay, lists, we can remove, we can add. We've got our first names there. Let's have our second names and I'll show you how we would remove uh, the first names, last names. And I'll show you how we would remove one using a number. So again, uh, I want to update my validity checks here. Uh, and this time around, I want to be checking the last names. Now you notice I'm using copy and paste here and you might get folks get there and they'll tell you like, no, never copy and paste. I, you, know, you should never ever be copying and pasting code. Uh, nonsense. Like, let's, let's be realistic here. Uh, I'm not gonna go and rewrite out a block of code where all I need to change is first to last. Um, copying and pasting code is fine. The big things that I would say, and the things that can make it, that you are key to making it fine, is you need to make sure that you are carefully checking through, that you're updating any bits that you need to. And I would also say, never copy and paste more than a screen's worth. Just keep it to be smaller blocks is what I would recommend, at least early on. Um, and that will avoid a lot of the problems that you can run into with, with copying and pasting where you forget to update stuff, things like of that. So, okay, we've got our last names. I'm going to pick a random last name and remove from the list. But I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. So, last name index, uh, let's make that selected. That is gonna be a random range, zero to last names count. Because what that lets me then do is string selected last name is my last names at that index. And then I can do last names remove at selected last name index. So then my names down here, I want to update those. So select the last name and then the chosen name here also gets updated. So what I'm doing is I am picking a random number between zero up to one less than the number of last names we have. Then I am retrieving that value because that same integer, I can use it in my square brackets. Then I am removing at that particular location. So we can remove at a specific location in it. So that's cool. So I'll need to set up my last names. 
before it can actually do anything. So let's make it that we've got five last names just to be consistent, actually six. Uh, so we're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Excellent. So now when we run that, we should see again, you know, the name is E6 and both E and six have been removed from those lists. So, okay, that gives us, you know, ways of working with the, the lists there, which is cool. That's really handy for containers where we need to change size. That's the main areas where I normally will use list is where I need to change size. Sometimes we don't actually need to change size of things. Sometimes we might just have a fixed set of things uh, that we're not modifying anything, anything like of that. So that's where we can use something called an array. So I'm going to set up an array and the way we write an array, so just like lists have type, arrays have a type as well. So this is going to be public because I want to be able to be configuring it in the inspector. It's an integer. And then I put the square brackets and then this is going to be starting health values. So arrays, we write type and then the square brackets. That indicates starting health values is an array. If we go to the inspector, in the inspector, doesn't look much different. We have our health values here and I'm going to set up four different ones. And so a lot of this looks exactly the same as it does for a list. And from the inspector point of view, we can reorder things if we want. Uh, so all of that works exactly the same as a list. The main difference is, is that when it's running, we can't go and add in an additional one. Okay, so I'm not gonna be able to add in extra ones to my health values there. So I go starting health values, I'll see there isn't a dot add, there isn't a remove. There's actually very few particular ones there. So I can't go and change those ones there. I can still access things the same way that I otherwise would have. So I could say, okay, the starting health, uh, that's what I complete, not helping me out there. So starting health, that could be my starting health values. Again, I use square brackets because I'm accessing an, an index of something. So that's my random range. Again, arrays like a list are zero based. And then I need the number of particular things. So starting health values, but I don't have count. Arrays, I have to use length. So lists, it's count. Arrays, it's length. And this would be starting health is, and then I can display the value. So pick a random starting health. So arrays, I can't remove something from it, but I still largely the rest of the stuff works the same. So I access stuff by a the square brackets with an index. And we'll see this will pick a random starting health. So now we've got random names, we've got random starting healths. Uh, so lists are, I use them if I need to be potentially changing the size of stuff. So I use them a lot for when I'm picking random things so that I can avoid duplicates because I can pick something from a list and remove it. I use arrays when I have a set of stuff that isn't changing in size. It's a fixed set of things and it's always going to be that fixed set of things. Uh, so stuff like potentially a starting health there, uh, you might use that for things like an inventory because if your inventory is a fixed size, then that's a really handy way of actually working with that. I can, just like with lists, I can have separate ones here. I can do the similar thing with arrays. So I could have here an array 
that is, let's say this is uh, going to be uh, chosen health values. And I could, similar to, you know, I can't add into that, but what I could do is I could say chosen health values, and in the first slot, add in the starting health. So store the starting health. So if I was putting together a roster of characters, a team of ones, this would be a way that I could be doing that. I might have five character slots, and then I'd put in the values for each particular one. But just like with lists where I had to do a new, I'm going to run into the same issue with, an, with the array, a null reference exception. And again, it's something that is on the left-hand side, typically. So in this case, it's not the left-hand side of a dot. Uh, we can also encounter it on the left-hand side of square brackets. So that's because the array hasn't actually been given a size. So I can do that up here. I would say that this is a new int and it can store four characters. So I can do that. And now if I come and run this, it will be okay. So arrays, if I'm not making it a public one that's there and configurable in the inspector, I need to actually go and uh, explicitly create it at a particular size. So, okay, lists and arrays. They are great for storing sets of data of the same type. It's things like names, uh, inventory items, your quests, all these different things. A list versus an array. A list is great if you need to change the size of it, either increasing it or decreasing it while the game is running. Whereas an array is if it's a fixed size. So that's the main choice between whether we're using each one. Having them as public means that we can just configure them in the inspector, we can reorder them. If they're not public, we need to make sure we manually tell it to be created. Otherwise, we're just saying, well, here's a marker where this can be. We haven't actually put the thing there. With lists, we can use count to check the, the number of values there. We can pick things from it and we access the position of something using square brackets. And lists and arrays, the very first position is zero. The very last position is the size of the list or array minus one. And we can remove things from a list based upon removing that particular item or removing something at a particular position. Arrays, we can't remove things from it, but we can just directly access things at the particular position. So that's our lists and arrays. And I mentioned we've got other types of things as well. And the other type of one that is a really handy one to take a look at is something called a dictionary. So I'm gonna create another script. So container demo two. And I'm going to attach this onto the cube. And so let's take a look at container demo two. So dictionaries are great if you're needing to store, uh, as I said, things like settings. So dictionaries are what's called an associative container. Um, so they store stuff where you have a key that you use to access the information and a value. And your key and your value can be fairly wide types. So an array or a list, the key that we use is only able to be integers. With a dictionary, it can be anything. So I could set up a dictionary that might be storing some difficulty settings, for example. So it could be, uh, it's storing a string and it's storing an integer. And these might be the health values per difficulty. Um, so I've made it public, 
And based on everything we've seen so far, that should mean it appears here in the inspector. But it won't. So there are some types that Unity will not be able to display in the inspector. A dictionary is one of those. Currently, anything that's a dictionary, Unity will not be able to put it into the inspector. There are ways and solutions around this. There are not always free solutions for this. Um, so one solution is you set up in the, in the inspector, what you do is you have a list of strings and a list of integers, which we know it can display. And then what we do is we uh, reconstruct the dictionary. Because the reason we use the dictionary is because it's really helpful for being able to store the stuff. So we could do that approach. The other options are we have various add-ons, as assets there for Unity that will be able to support this. Again, a lot of those are not going to be free. Um, and it's something where certainly if you're in the early stages of development uh, or learning development, I wouldn't be looking at getting any paid assets just yet. I would hold off at the moment until you have a better sense of where you could use them, how you might use them. So I wouldn't, I really recommend don't rush out and go and grab ones. Just wait, work out you know, exactly what you need, whether there might be other solutions for it. So for now, this dictionary, I am actually just going to bring it down into the function because actually no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it up here as something that I could use anywhere. So how do we store stuff into this? So the way we store stuff into a dictionary is, so string is the, the first thing is the key, the second thing is the value. So I'm using a string, but I could be using an integer, I could be using all manner of different things. And what I'm storing here could be all manner of different things. But the way I store stuff is, okay, so this might be our you know, easy in the health values there, it might be 500. So I can just store stuff in it like this. So easy, medium, might be, uh, let's say 250 health values. We might have then hard is 100. And then and have one that is one hit point. So we can just add stuff in like that. And then what that would mean is the way I then access that stuff is I can say debug log, the HP for medium is health values per difficulty. And then I just put in medium. So this is the really nice thing with dictionaries. We just access stuff via key. So this is really great for settings. Um, they're, they're very, very helpful. And I'm a really big fan of dictionaries for organizing information. Uh, so that looks cool. Let's save it and let's run it. There is gonna be a, a couple of errors we hit into. And that's something that, again, if you want to pause, have a think about what you reckon the error will be. Because uh, we're about to hit the moment of truth and find out what the error will be. It will error though. So again, our, our old favorite, no reference exception. And as I said, it's good to get used to seeing no reference exceptions because we will see them a lot. They will, they're, 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 I don't think I've had a project where I have not managed to hit a no reference exception. Um, it just, it's, it's a constant thing. So it's good to just get used to seeing them now. So again, I have marked out a space on the floor where I've said, here is where the chair is going to be, but I haven't created the chair. I haven't built it. So similar process, new, and we can see autocomplete is already guessing what it needs to be. And it's correct. It needs to be, it ma always is going to match whatever is to the left of the variable name. So if I do this and then run this, we'll be able to see what happens. 
So hit points for medium is 250. So now we have a really easy way of being able to look up because we had lots of different settings. We can just, each one we just check based upon the particular uh, one there because we could also have a dictionary. And this might be speed modifiers per difficulty. And that's another new dictionary. Again, we make sure we've constructed it. And I am again uh, going to make use of copy and paste uh, just to quickly update all of these. And then, okay, the speed modifier at easy, we might make it 0.25 at medium, 0.75, hard might be 1.5, and then at the uh, Y difficulty, we'll make it 10. Because uh, then we can add in here, and the speed is speed modifiers per difficulty, medium. So we should see our, our particular information appear for that. So let's run that. Speed is 0.75, so that's cool. And we can make this a little bit nicer of, we could have here a, and actually let's put this up here, public, String difficulty, and I might set that to medium because then down here where I was using just the string, I can change that. So now I have some, and this is the way it might look in the code, like in, in, in sort of a larger project where you just have some a central thing that you're checking for the difficulty so that it runs. We can see, yep, we got medium and 0.75, but then we could switch over to easy. And there are other ways that we could set up that difficulty, other variable types that would make it a bit neater to work with. Uh, but we have it as that and then run it. And we can see, so I needed to update the comment. So that's the on me. Um, there will be times where I make mistakes in these. Sometimes those will be intentional. Uh, other times like that, they will be completely unintentional. Uh, but that's the thing. You run into errors and that's fine. So now we've got that. It's displaying the correct things. We can change that to displaying the data for hard. And we can see, cool, so that's all updating. So it's a handy thing with dictionaries. You can store all this information, you can look up the particular stuff, um, and it's a bit of a nicer way of working with it than, you know, we could say, okay, use lists for this and easy is zero and one is medium and two is hard, but it is not something that is as uh, user-friendly to work with from a development point of view. Uh, so dictionaries give us a bit more of a developer friendly way of working with that information. Um, and it also means we use, we're not using as sort of hard coded a magic value because that's something that could so easily go wrong of having to remember zero is this, one is this. It's much easier just to be able to use the correct text. Um, because I'll get these comments quickly in, so set up our health values. I'll show you what happens if you try to look up a value in a dictionary that doesn't exist. Uh, speed modifiers. Because, let's say I got a typo, and let's say I just had, uh, rather than this, if I just put Y, so I've I haven't got the name right. Let's see what happens. Key not found. So again, we're getting a, you know, we're, we, we let it fail. We, we let it sit, show us the messages uh, so that we know what's actually gone wrong. And in this case, the key is not present. So we know exactly the line that that's happened on. We know, well, here's the dictionaries, here's the key. So we can easily identify the particular problems. So this is the advantage of having, you know, the, uh, just letting the errors happen. 
um, and also using a dictionary. We use things that have meaning, but we also get good error checking if we get it wrong, uh, which is handy. We can, add, we can remove stuff from a dictionary if we wanted to. So health values per difficulty, you can remove particular ones. So say we accidentally removed the particular one. This will cause an error, and I'm going to put a comment above this. This line will cause an error because it removes the difficulty we are about to read from. So let's run this, and we should see that same key not found exception, which we do. So that's good. So I'm going to comment that out so we're not running it. I'm going to check in another line. This line will modify the health for the selected difficulty. So health values per difficulty, we might say that is equal to 10,000. Uh, so we might be trying to debug an issue and we're just like, we're just going to, whatever difficulty, we're just going to make it that we've got ridiculous amounts of health. Um, so just a little bit of debugging stuff that we're throwing in there to make life easier for us. So we can see, yep, it's overridden and it's changed the health value there. So I'm going to comment that back out. So recapping on dictionaries. Dictionaries are a way of storing information where we've got a key that could be any particular type and we have a value that can be a range of different types as well. So really handy for storing settings, configuration, things like that. We have to go the same process of newing them. Making these public won't allow them to be editable in the inspector. So dictionaries they, they are not something that will appear in the inspector without getting add-ons for, for being able to do that. We can directly add values in, similar to lists and arrays, we use square brackets to indicate the particular key that we are looking up. We can modify an existing key easily enough. We can also remove particular ones if we need. So a lot of similar functionality there uh, to the behaviors with the lists. Uh, and again, when we are looking at loops and iteration, we'll actually revisit dictionaries and see some of the additional things that we can then be doing there uh, with the loops. So these are a good thing to be making sure you're practicing with. You know, grab the code for this. Add in additional things, starting adding in middle names. You know, try out different things, see what errors you get as well. See what happens you know, if you try and you know, remove something that doesn't exist, for example. Or you know, if you try and add the same thing multiple times, see what happens, see what things will cause problems, see what things will change the behavior. Those are really good things to be experimenting with. Don't worry about if you run into a whole bunch of exceptions. If you do, you can just always go and grab the code, uh, the fresh copy of the code from the internet. Even better, grab that fresh copy, put it in a separate location and compare it. Look at it side by side with the code that's broken. See if you can spot the differences and then progressively make changes so that they're identical, so that they are back working. So experiment with the code. That's a really big thing that would very much recommend doing. Uh, it's going to be really helpful for getting more familiar with what's actually happening there. Thanks folks, that is all for this video. If you're looking for the project, you'll be able to find it up on GitHub and I've put a link to that in the description below. If you've got any feedback, any questions, please chuck in a comment. And if you're looking to find ways to support the channel, 
chucking in a like or subscribing to the channel is always a big help. If you're looking to go further than that, then I do have a Patreon set up and any support there is super appreciated. And there's a bunch of different things that you're, you'll get as part of being a, a patron there. And the big thing is it's going to help me make more cool things like this, which is going to help more people uh, like yourself to be making more games, which is awesome. And that is, that is, that is all for now. Thank you.